We have an excellent class lined up for you today. So thank you for all of us who have joined us for the previous two classes today. And we'll go ahead and get started with our final class of the day. I see Colonel Wiggs has started a recording. Again, all classes here at WAMA are being recorded and they'll be posted and they can be found on our WAMA website, wama.wwg.cap.gov. This last class is going to be two hours and we're gonna be talking about natural hazards in aviation. Last month, we talked about the non-meteorological hazards. And this month, we're gonna focus on those meteorological hazards and weather and all that stuff and how that affects flying. We have a great list of different guest speakers for you today, all coordinated by our Wing Director of Aerospace Education, Major Sylvie Kasmarsik. So thank you everyone for joining us. I will stop presenting my screen and I will turn it over to Major Kasmarsik, who can get started with our last class of the day here at March Warma. Hello, how are you doing? Can you see my screen or is it not showing? Because uh, I see a dark thing. I... On my end, ma'am, it says that you've started sharing your screen. But I show the screen, so it's not very useful, is it? <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. I'll try again. <laughs> And, oh, great, love it when the computer is not doing what you need. Okay, well, um, <laughs> so uh, I apologize, you, you won't see the, the screen right away. I'll solve the, the problem while uh, my colleague is gonna be presenting. Uh, um, good afternoon. I'm a Major C.V. Kasmorsik. I'm uh, the Washington Wing uh, Director of Aerospace Education and also WAMA AEO. And uh, today we have a list of um, guest speakers and we're really excited about having everybody joining in, both students and um, and. Um, guest speakers. And um, we are going to start by housekeeping, safety briefing. Um, I want to make sure that everybody has an emergency person near them so that if you have a problem during this training, do you all have somebody near you that you can call on if uh, you have uh, a medical situation or emergency problem. If um, also, if we see that nobody is coming, uh, we will have one of our administrators that will be using the emergency phone number that you gave to contact your um, household or potentially call 911 if needed. Hopefully we don't have to do that today. I don't want to have to do that, but we just want to make sure everybody's okay. Uh, it's a two hour class. Make sure to stay hydrated and well-fed. Uh, I advise to have some water and snacks always. Keep your brain active. It's very useful. And uh, as we are um, doing a virtual training, you're around electro electrical and electronic equipment. So Stay very cautious walking around, don't trip on cables and uh, stay away from live wires and anything that can um, electrocute you and keep the fluids away from electronic, they are not compatible. Um, as for participation, uh, questions and comments can go in the in the chat box. Uh, if you have a hard time finding the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see something that's a chat and it has a, a cartoon bubble on top of that. If you click on that, that will open a chat box that you can have on the side. And uh, that will be a great way for you to, um, to communicate with us during the presentation. We have a variety of guests who came. Um, and uh, so we will ask for anecdotes here and there as we go through the different meteorological hazards. And uh, we are asking that we keep the anecdotes to two to five minutes, the very, very most. Two minutes is a better number so that we have enough time to give everybody the opportunity to share, but also to cover all the material we need to share today. Um, from now, I'm going to hand over the 
the mic and the computer to senior member Robert Conrick, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Washington in the meteorology department. So we do have a specialist doing meteorology this month. So thank you very much for all of you for attending this class. And thank you very much, uh, senior member Conrick, for joining us and preparing this class. Stay yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Major Kesmersik. Uh, can everybody hear me okay before I share my screen? Great. Excellent. Um, so, and once again, can everybody see my screen? All right. See a couple of heads nodding. Great. So as uh, Major Kesmersik said, my name is uh, Robert Conrick. I'm a PhD candidate at the uh, University of Washington. And uh, my Areas of expertise are in weather forecasting, um, and uh, in particular, my, my research focuses on uh, precipitation here in the Northwest, as well as uh, wildfires. Um, so today, uh, today's topic for uh, WAMA is natural hazards in aviation, particularly uh, meteorological hazards. So I wanted to start off first uh, by just asking uh, you folks, uh, what kinds of meteorological aviation hazards can you all name? And uh, I believe uh, Major Kasmersik is uh, monitoring the chat uh, and otherwise feel free to, to unmute yourself. So in the chat, I see um, fire, snow, wind, rain, thunder, lightning, wind shear, lightning, icing, fog, low, low ceiling. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you, you guys are, are good. Uh, you've named a lot of the, a lot of the topics that uh, we'll be uh, covering today. So uh, kind of on the agenda is a lot of different topics, uh, a lot of material, um, things ranging from, like you guys mentioned, fog and uh, low cloud ceilings all the way through hurricanes, something we don't see too much uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and then we'll sort of end the class talking about uh, some mountain hazards, uh, as well as turbulence and uh, aircraft icing. So I just want to sort of, before I get into everything, I just want to say that uh, uh, we're talking about the hazards, uh, the aviation hazards associated with a lot of these things. So uh, we won't be going uh, incredibly in-depth to a lot of the uh, science behind a lot of these. We will in, in some topics, but uh, for the most part, this is really focused on hazards, on kind of understanding the uh, issues associated with some of these meteorological phenomena. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm totally happy to answer any, any uh, you know, really hard science questions if, uh, if anybody has them though. So, um, also this uh, presentation today is really focused on the weather aspect of uh, aviation, right? So all of these uh, different uh, meteorological events are really weather focused. And so as a result, we won't be talking so much about uh, climate or the impact of uh, climate change, for instance, on, uh, on aviation. And so I thought it would be kind of nice uh, along those lines to start off with a kind of brief slide talking about some of the differences between weather and climate. So uh, weather describes the kind of current conditions outside uh, or the recent conditions, uh, as well as sort of the, the forecast, what to expect uh, going forward. So some of the questions that kind of are, are weather questions would be, you know, is it going to rain today? Uh, what's, you know, tomorrow's high temperature going to be? Or, you know, a question like, was yesterday sunny? So that sort of deals with the current uh, future, and just kind of the, the really recent past. Whereas climate uh, handles the 
normal conditions for an area. So uh, for climate, uh, some of the questions we'd be asking ourselves would be, uh, what's the normal temperature for January or something like, you know, how much snow does Richland, Washington get every single year? So this graphic here on the right is from the uh, National Weather Service, and I think it sums it up really perfectly. So the weather tells you what to wear each day, right? So the, the weather outside today tells you whether or not you should be wearing uh, shorts and sandals or, you know, if you need a, uh, a heavy coat, right? But the climate tells you what kinds of clothes you should have in your closet. So if you have a lot of, uh, you know, sandals and, and shorts in your closet, you know, you probably live somewhere where it gets uh, rather warm. But, uh, you know, if you have coats and scarves, uh, you know, probably the opposite, right? It's probably a cold climate. So for aviation, your next flight you take is really dictated by the weather, right? The weather will dictate how high you fly, uh, perhaps uh, even where you take your flight. But where the airport is built that you're taking off or landing from and how that airport is built uh, depends a lot on the local climate. And so this image here on the right is a picture of uh, SeaTac International Airport. And uh, if you guys have flown in and out of SeaTac, uh, you'd know that the runways are oriented north-south. Uh, and there's a very specific reason for that. And that's because most of the uh, wind over Puget Sound, uh, climatologically speaking, is either from a north or a south direction. So we build our airports uh, to uh, accommodate the climate. So with, uh, with that bit uh, aside, uh, let's jump into some of our uh, weather hazards, uh, some of our meteorological hazards now. So the first uh, hazard we'll be talking about uh, is fog. Uh, it's something that you know I think we're all uh, familiar with in some way. Uh, we've all seen fog, experienced it, uh, maybe not have all flown in it, but uh, certainly uh, experienced it. And we can really think of fog as uh, nothing more than shallow clouds that are in contact with the ground itself. And we'll talk uh, on the next slide about how fog uh, forms and under what conditions. But I wanted to mention that uh, something like 24% of all aviation disasters and accidents are caused by fog. And uh, fog leads to millions of dollars of losses every single year for the aviation industry. Now that includes delays uh, and accidents uh, and other uh, hazards uh, and other issues associated with fog. So fog forms typically under some uh, fairly uh, well-known, fairly common conditions. Um, the conditions are uh, pretty common here in the Pacific Northwest too. We're no stranger to fog. So fog forms usually at night into the early morning when it's coolest. And fog tends to form under clear skies, like I said, when temperatures are cool, and also when the wind is light. And for you uh, weather uh, geeks out there and those of you interested in the weather, uh, you know all three of these conditions, clear skies, cool nighttime temperatures, and light wind corresponds to having a high pressure system uh, in place. So fog uh, tends to be uh, co-located with high pressure. And then, you know, in order to form those clouds that are in contact with the ground, we need humid air too. So the idea being that overnight temperatures cool, the air is really moist, and eventually the air temperature reaches, it cools down enough that it reaches the dew point temperature, which tells us how much moisture is in the air. And when that happens, we begin to condense water vapor out uh, of the atmosphere and form cloud droplets. And that's basically the fog, are those cloud droplets. So fog can form generally anywhere where these conditions are met, uh, but it's especially common in low-lying areas. So in uh, river valleys, uh, along lakes, um, 
for those uh, of you that might be in uh, Western Washington, um, over Puget Sound is a, a pretty common place for, uh, for fog to form. There's some out there uh, yesterday, in fact. So uh, I mentioned that fog is, is pretty costly for aviation. Um, and uh, here's just two examples of uh, times when fog was responsible for aviation disasters. So uh, the first being the uh, Tenerife air disaster in 1977. And uh, Major Kasmersik uh, is going to mention this one, I believe, in a, a moment or so. Uh, but the other one uh, that's uh, much more recent is the Smolensk uh, air catastrophe that happened in 2010. Uh, it happened in Russia. There was uh, less than uh, 500 meters or about 1,500 feet of visibility. And uh, some of you may remember that uh, this was the uh, crash that killed the president of Poland, as well as his, uh, uh, more or less his entire cabinet. So uh, very devastating uh, for the, the country of Poland. So I'm going to uh, turn it over now to uh, Major Kasmersik, uh, who will talk about some uh, fog anecdotes. I'm having problem with the computer. I usually don't, but uh, I am today. So I'm going to be sharing from the other computer, which means that I will lose access to the chat. Um, so just to give you a heads up. So um, I apologize for that. And um, this is really frustrating. I didn't have that problem in the past. Mm. Okay, share screen. I'm going to share this one. Share. Okay, so we can see it. And now I'm going to open Okay, can you see that one now? You can? You good? Can you hear me? Um, can people hear me? Because I don't hear anything. We can hear you and see your screen. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I was having some technical problem. So um, as uh, Senior Member Conrick mentioned, um, on Sunday, the 27th of March, 1977, um, in, at Tenerife, Tenerife, which is in the Canary Islands near Spain, there was a, a fatal runway collision between two Boeing 747 at the airport over there. These two aircraft were in, in that place where they were not supposed to be because there was um, bomb threats on the main island and the airport of Las Palmas was shut down and they rerouted all the aircraft to go to Tenerife Island and to their airport. And that's actually a pretty small airport. And so we have the a KLM and a Pan Am um, Boeing 747 that enter collision and we have 583 people who were killed in that collision. And the uh, causes of the, the collision is actually limited visibility due to fog, but mostly communication issues. And the fog was such that they were unable to adjust because they didn't have the visibility to see that the other aircraft was coming. So if we look at the... Um, at the configuration of the air, the airports of Tenerife, you had the aircraft were parked there, all the aircraft that were evacuated from Las Palmas, and the two Boeing 747 that we're talking about were parked in that area of uh, Los Rodeos air airports. And um, one of the aircraft, the KLM aircraft was sent to move forwards and to turn around uh, at the three zero runway, then be able to come back to take off. At the same time, we have the Pan Am aircraft 
that was told to come onto this runway, and that's 12 over there, one, two. And it was told to go up and to take the third taxiway because the first and the second were crowded by the other aircraft, to take the third taxiway to get out of the way so that the KLM aircraft will be able to take off. And it just happened that the fog developed and covered the airport at the time of these two aircraft being on the runway at the same time and going in opposite direction. The fog was so dense that the aircraft could not see each other and the control tower was unable to see the aircraft also. And there was some communication between uh, the ATC and the two aircraft. Um, there was overlap of conversation, of communication between these three um, members, if you want, and that created some confusion that led the KLM pilot, the captain, to think that he was clear to take off when in real the Pan Am aircraft was still on the runway. What is kind of weird is uh, from what I've read, the Pan Am aircraft was supposed to take the third taxiway, the, so that would be ABC, the C taxiway, and get out of the way. But the accident happened just before the fourth taxiway. So it seems that because of fog or condition, don't know exactly why, um, the Pan Am aircraft went further than it was supposed to be, and the KLM aircraft started to pick up speed to take off when it was not fully clear, and the overlap of communication uh, was such that they could not hear clearly what was going on, and the lack of visibility meant that they were unable to adjust by saying that the the runway was not free, was not open. So that was a big deal for the aviation industry and that pushed towards um, regulations and modification for communication. As you can see in the picture of the bottom right, that was very devastating. On the uh, uh, earlier picture, you saw all the, the burning it, and all the people were the majority, uh, one of the aircraft, the people were totally, um, the whole crew and all the men, passengers were killed while the other ones, some people were saved. So that was a pretty bad accident. And that's all I have for fog. But I would like to now call on to participants if any of our participants have some experience of incidents caused by fog. If you do, you can unmute yourself or you can put your name in the chat and I'll call on you. Okay, fog is a typical thing. You wanna check your weather and you wanna be very cautious and adjust your flying. Uh, from there, I'm gonna give the mic back to city member Conrick. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. All right, so we're gonna shift gears then a bit out of fog and uh, move towards uh, another topic. But as we sort of transition, uh, I wanna ask you guys uh, yet another question. Uh, what do you think is the deadliest type of weather? Go ahead and uh, unmute yourself or uh, put it in the chat. by individual thing or by um, most occurring or, I mean, people live through tornadoes, but lightning, and they live through lightning strikes, but lightning's pretty, pretty high on the list. Yeah, so just sort of on, I guess you could say on average, uh, what type of weather kills the most people uh, every year? can't see the chat, it seems. Rain that causes mudslides? Mudslides are a good one. Um, that's something that uh, we'll, we'll actually get to uh, a little bit later. Um, 
So, okay, so I can see the chat now. It looks like some people have written uh, thunderstorms, hurricanes, uh, wind seems to be uh, seems to be a common one too. Um, I see uh, somebody wrote tornadoes. Would anybody be surprised if I told you that it's actually none of those? And the number one uh, deadliest kind of weather is actually extreme heat. So this chart here on the right is from uh, the National Weather Service. Uh, this is from 2019. I couldn't find anything uh, more recent. Uh, usually takes a little while for the, the statistics to get computed. But on average, this uh, yellow bar is a 30-year average. On average, uh, heat, extreme heat is the number one killer when it comes to uh, weather. Uh, followed uh, kind of uh, close behind by uh, flooding, which is another, uh, another topic that we'll get to here in a, a little bit today. So the reason why high temperatures and extreme heat is so uh, deadly is that it really puts a, a, a huge strain on the human body. So when the air is both hot and humid, uh, the human body becomes really, really inefficient at cooling itself. And so one way that uh, meteorologists have uh, for measuring this is uh, the heat index, which is something that uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with. Uh, if you use a uh, kind of weather app on your phone, you may uh, see something that uh, sort of looks like, you know, feels like temperature or, or something like that. And anyway, the idea behind the heat index is that as your humidity increases, so increasing humidity goes down here on the right, and as your temperature increases, that increases here to the right, you have a much higher apparent temperature. And the reason for that is that with hot weather, uh, the body sweats to cool itself, right? Uh, but if it's really humid as well, then that sweat doesn't evaporate off of your skin, uh, at least not as, as readily. And so the body can't quite cool itself properly. And so it feels a lot hotter than it actually is. So the heat index measures this effect. And uh, really, you know, I know we're talking about aviation today, uh, but when it comes to uh, CAP, you know, relief missions, uh, perhaps in a, in a disaster zone, or if you're part of a ground crew, uh, keeping in mind the heat index is really important for ensuring that, uh, you know, you don't suffer any kind of heat related uh, illness like, uh, like heat stroke or, uh, or exhaustion. So, you know, another thing when it comes to heat is that, uh, you know, the definition of a hot day really does depend on where you live, right? Depends on where you're at. So, you know, uh, I'm located in uh, Seattle right now. And, uh, you know, a hot day for us is, is 80. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're in Eastern Washington, uh, you know, 80 is oftentimes a, a totally normal uh, summer day, right? So the definition between Eastern and Western Washington is very different when it comes to uh, what, you know, a person considers hot. But uh, as far as the effects felt on the body, uh, it doesn't matter where you live. Um, a, a high heat index, so that combination of, of hot weather and, and high humidity uh, can still be can still be very, uh, very hazardous. So, you know, back to aviation, uh, hot weather has a huge impact on uh, aircraft performance. Uh, when the air is hot, uh, that air is also much less dense than cold air. So as a result, your density altitude uh, will rise with hot air. And the result of this much higher density altitude and this hot air is less lift and a much longer takeoff is needed in order to get your plane off the ground. And so that's illustrated here on the right-hand side. This top panel would be, you know, maybe in the winter time, for instance. So having cold air in place and this aircraft right here that's just taken off uh, needed a, a takeoff roll of 1300 feet 
and then climbs at a rate of also 1300 feet. Whereas if it's a hot summer day, for instance, uh, then the density altitude in this case is 5,000 feet. Uh, and that requires a much longer takeoff roll and you end up having a uh, more shallow rate of climb. So you need a longer runway to be able to clear perhaps obstacles at the end, uh, end of the runway. So along with you know, those hazards associated with, with extreme heat. Uh, we also have uh, wildfires that we have to contend with here in the Western US. And oftentimes those wildfires occur kind of in tandem with that really hot and dry weather. So airports are certainly not immune from wildfires. Uh, this image is from an airport webcam in uh, Fort McMurray, Canada. Uh, some of you may remember a few years ago, there was a massive wildfire that uh, moved through that area. This is in uh, kind of north central uh, Canada. And the fire burned very close to the airport. I think it actually did burn a few buildings at the airport itself. Um, and just kind of really highlights that, you know, airports aren't immune from uh, these, kinds of, these kinds of natural disasters. Smoke is also a big concern when it comes to uh, wildfires. Um, some of you may remember uh, just this past September, uh, we had a ton of smoke uh, over the region. And this is a satellite image from NASA uh, that shows just this huge smoke plume spreading all the way from uh, you know, uh, several hundred miles offshore to you know, parts of uh, Southern uh, British Columbia into uh, Idaho, even as far as Utah, uh, the smoke made it. So, you know, obviously having all of this wildfire smoke in the atmosphere had a tremendous impact on uh, visibility uh, of aircraft. And here's a picture on the right of a Cessna. And uh, this particular passenger is looking out the window into, you know, what, what, what are they looking at? right? It's a, a huge cloud of wildfire smoke. Um, so one hazard with smoke is that at the surface, your conditions might be fine to fly, especially if you're flying VFR. Might be relatively clear, uh, might have, you know, okay visibility. But as soon as you take off and you encounter that cloud of smoke and that plume of smoke, your visibility can be dangerously reduced uh, just sort of in a, in a matter of, you know, a few hundred feet, maybe a thousand feet. And the reason for that is that near the surface, there's a lot of thermals, which we'll get to uh, in a moment, uh, but there's a lot of thermals and that tends to mix the atmosphere in the lowest levels. And so that can result in relatively clear air sort of near the ground. Uh, but once you get above that layer, then your visibility is, uh, is very poor. So uh, this picture is a, a really good example of that. So one thing that's really interesting, I think, about wildfires is they do sometimes sort of produce their own weather associated with them, especially uh, if the wildfire is really intense, if it's a very large fire, uh, or if it's burning through uh, very dry fuels. So here on the left, uh, I'm going to play a video that's an example of a severe thunderstorm in Texas that was actually spawned by, uh, by a wildfire. And each of these videos is just a, a couple of seconds long. There's no sound. Um, but this particular uh, cloud right here, I'll pause that real quick. This particular cloud right here, there's a wildfire underneath. And that wildfire is producing so much heat that it's causing air to rise. And that rising air is then condensing, forming clouds and precipitation. And uh, for a while, this, this particular storm actually had a uh, severe thunderstorm warning associated with it and uh, produced uh, very large hail for uh, some of the communities that were, that were in its path. Um, Another kind of really stark example of the weather that uh, wildfires can produce 
are fire NATOs. And I'll play this video here on the right. This is from Eastern Washington. Um, and uh, you sort of see it in the preview here, but there's a tornado, well, a fire NATO associated with this wildfire right here. Uh, these fire NATOs tend to be fairly shallow, uh, never really extending much more than a, a couple hundred meters. Uh, uh, and a hundred meters is pretty rare, quite frankly. Um, but it goes to show that uh, these, these wildfires do produce so much heat that they can spawn things like severe thunderstorms and, uh, and fire NATOs. And so uh, other hazards uh, around wildfires would include uh, strong winds, all of that rising air leads to uh, wind that's that's kind of flowing in towards the uh, towards the fire itself and that can produce a lot of low level wind shear if you're flying uh, and that can happen even far away from the fire itself um, and then of course you know impacts from uh, smoke visibility uh, and then you know the potential for uh, lightning associated with one of these uh, storms spawned by a wildfire. So, so I'll uh, turn it back over once again to uh, Major Kasmersik uh, for a few anecdotes related to uh, wildfires, heat, uh, and smoke. As we can see in my, there's a, a problem. I don't know, usually I'm able to share. I don't have problem, but today the computer does not want me to share, which is really annoying. I'm so sorry. So I restarted my computer hoping that I will be able to, to, to use the other computer, but I can't. Um, here we go. So, we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about heat, smoke, wildfire. The anecdotes I have are from um, Major Brian Sikema, who is um, a, an evaluation pilot and pilot at the US Air Force. He's based at Fairchild Air Force Base near Spokane. And he's in the 384th Air Refueling Squadron where he's director of operations. And he was mentioning that extreme heat is an, an issue not only for the air and ground crew because it gets really hot and we have all these heat exhaustion, heat strokes and all the, uh, the stress on the humans, but there's also stress on the aircraft. And one of uh, the deployment that he talked about was when he was in Qatar, in Qatar, in the Persian Gulf, where the temperatures will reach 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And the KC-135 tankers that he was flying do not have air conditioning for the crew. So they were sweating, cooking in there. Apparently the boom compartment under the aircraft that you have um, here, the boom compartment and here's the boom to refuel the jet under, oops, sorry, um, will reach 150 degrees. So that was a big issue to keep all the crew hydrated and not having this type of problem. But they do have, um, air conditioning cooling system for the avionics. And what they were talking about is like the main goal of the KC-135 uh, is to provide fuel to the jets up in the air as they're in mission to extend their mission. And, but during the hot weather, how we just talked about the density, altitudes changing and modifying the, um, the aircraft performance, the heat is such that it lower the aircraft performance, it lower the thrust. So they in to compensate for that, they have to reduce how much fuel they're gonna put in the tanker. And they remove they reduce that of about 20%. So fuel capacity, maximum capacity for a KC-135 is about 200 pounds, and they will reduce of about 30. 
uh, 200,000 pounds, sorry, and they will reduce of about 30,000 pounds to be able to compensate and be able to fly safely the aircraft and function. So it's, it's actually really surprising for that. The other um, concern they have is with the auxiliary power unit, the APU. Um, it provides less thrust during the, the hot weather. So they end up having to spin the, the APU longer and faster before they're able to send the fuel in it to provide the, the thrust and of uh, avoid the overheating before they're able to really start the um, KC-135. So that was like on the heat on that side. For the wildfire, he talked shortly about um, um, last summer, how there was a wildfire near uh, Fairchild Air Force Base. And he was uh, flying um, and doing patterns near the base when he received a message from the ATC asking him uh, and his crew to check the, the nearby fire so that they could see if they needed to call for emergency, you know, for firefighters and all that. And it, it was getting closer and they were with the smoke also, they were getting concerned and uh, we're starting to plan evacuation of the base, uh, especially the aircraft and the personnel. Um, and uh, they ended up shutting the airfields to allow the, allow the firefighting aircraft, plant and helicopter to come and work properly. Uh, so on the upper right, you see a picture taken from the aircraft when it was up in the air. So you can see the smoke. The bottom is the airfield. And here you can see the firefighters the aircraft uh, flying and taking care of the fire near the near the base. So it is an ongoing thing in Eastern Washington, as you all know. He also provided a picture that shows um, the KC-10 extenders that were put um, kind of stored temporarily at or parked temporarily at uh, Fairchild Air Force Base because there were fires in California and these aircraft and airmen were coming from Travis Air Force Base that was evacuated due to a lightning complex fire near, near the base. So you can see a lot of aircraft and a lot of people and they were there temporarily. And that's what they do every time there's a major uh, disaster that is gonna happen or major hazard coming by to protect the equipment and the personnel as much as possible if the aircraft Aircraft are in flying condition, they're going to be flown out and parked somewhere else, and the people will be taken out also. He was saying that, for example, they had a Chinook um, helicopter that arrived with 98 people inside. So I don't know how they crammed them like sardines in there, but 98 people in a Chinook aircraft. Um, and um, for the thunderstorm, do you want to do them now or afterwards? Uh, let's do that afterwards. Okay. So I'll wait. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Excellent. And uh, just as a, as a reminder, as we uh, continue on, um, feel free to type any questions you might have uh, into the chat as we go or, uh, or, or comments even. Um, we want this to be as interactive as possible. I know it's a, a ton of a uh, ton of information for uh, for such a, a short period of time. So uh, the next type of, of hazard on our list uh, are thunderstorms. So here's a photo of a uh, uh, cumulonimbus uh, thunderstorm. And here's the, the anvil associated with that. We'll go into some detail about their uh, formation uh, here in a, just a moment. But first, um, you know, pretty much anywhere in the United States sees thunderstorms. Uh, they can happen anywhere in the US. Uh, they are extremely common east of the Rocky Mountains, especially along the Gulf Coast. So here's a map uh, from uh, the Weather Service that shows the number of thunderstorm days per year. So the number of days where there was uh, at least one thunderstorm uh, reported. And, you know, maybe no surprise, but Florida uh, has the highest number in the United States. Uh, pretty much the entire eastern U.S. 
east of the Rockies has an appreciable number of thunderstorms every single year. Uh, the reason for that is uh, the eastern U.S. has much more humid air generally than, uh, than the western uh, U.S. That's the biggest factor. Uh, but also there's a nice combination of warm temperatures and humid air that impact uh, places like Florida or uh, locations along the uh, Gulf Coast. So that's uh, kind of provides the perfect uh, fuel for thunderstorms. Now here in uh, Washington, uh, the eastern part of the state, eastern Washington, sees uh, approximately twice as many thunderstorm days as uh, western Washington. So even though they are uh, fairly rare, uh, they do happen and they happen more frequently uh, in the eastern part of the state. So I'm gonna play a short video, again, just a few seconds, uh, highlighting the formation of thunderstorms. So this is taken uh, overlooking this valley and you see all of these kind of puffy clouds that are uh, kind of shooting up and that cloud right there is a uh, thunderstorm that's just developed uh, over this valley. Let me go back a little bit here. So the beginning of the video, just kind of these nice puffy clouds, kind of a, a beautiful day, uh, quite frankly. And then uh, as these thermals, these pockets of rising air continue, uh, eventually uh, one of them has enough strength that it's able to uh, grow much larger in the vertical and uh, right there and kind of reach that, uh, that threshold of, of what we consider to be a, uh, be a thunderstorm. I'm a big fan of this video. I, I actually show it all the time in the, in the classes that I teach. So when it comes to formation of thunderstorms, uh, most storms go through a pretty typical uh, life cycle. So there's really three stages to uh, a thunderstorm developing. The first stage, uh, sometimes called the uh, cumulus stage or the developing stage, um, is kind of what we saw at the beginning of that video where you have kind of nice uh, white puffy cumulus clouds, uh, maybe that are growing a little bit in the vertical, but, but not, uh, you know, not, especially deep. And within a developing thunderstorm or within one of these large cumulus clouds, uh, we would tend to find uh, a good bit of turbulence. Remember, this is rising air. Um, and so if you were to fly through one of these, uh, you would feel a kind of jolt upwards. And then as you leave the, uh, as you leave the cloud, um, sometimes you'll also feel a jolt back downwards. Uh, that's you traveling through the updraft and then uh, through the downdraft. So as the storm grows larger um, and sort of taps into the instability of the atmosphere, uh, it develops a uh, stronger updraft and then also a fairly strong downdraft that's, uh, that's associated with it. So underneath the downdraft is where we find uh, precipitation. Uh, if there's a tornado, it would be kind of within that vicinity. Uh, but again, if you were to fly through a thunderstorm, which is not a great idea, but if you were to fly through a thunderstorm, you would, uh, especially a mature thunderstorm, you would experience uh, extreme turbulence, uh, possibly large hail, depending on where you're at. And there's also the threat of lightning associated with these storms. And we'll talk in a minute about kind of how to identify uh, to some extent the potential for lightning. And then finally, as this thunderstorm has grown and then sort of uh, rained itself out uh, or the environment has become unfavorable for it to continue, uh, it dissipates. And in the dissipating stage, uh, oftentimes all you really see is the anvil of the storm and everything below the anvil is associated with uh, downdraft or descending air. And so it's in this stage that we tend to see 
uh, downbursts, um, pretty common, and then also the continued threat for lightning uh, associated with the, the anvil cloud. So quick mention of hail, uh, since uh, hail does pose a huge threat for aviation, as we'll see uh, in the, uh, the next set of anecdotes, I believe. Um, the idea behind hail is that, and you can sort of look at the right-hand side of this graphic, uh, the idea behind hail is that you have rain that's falling out of your storm, and some of that rain gets sucked back up into the storm. So raindrops get sucked back into the updraft of a storm, and that rain uh, eventually travels high enough that it passes the freezing level and begins to cycle through the storm and collect uh, additional water onto the outside of it. And so the hail basically can stay suspended in the cloud uh, for as long as gravity uh, will allow it. Eventually the hailstone becomes too large and the updraft can't lift it up anymore. And so the hailstones will uh, then fall out of the storm and you know, damage crops, buildings, cars, uh, or aircraft. So speaking of aircraft, uh, a few pictures from online uh, and we'll see some more uh, in the anecdotes, I believe. But uh, here on the, on the uh, left are some divots caused by uh, hailstones on the, uh, the wing of a general aviation aircraft. Uh, and you can imagine that these, these divots um, can severely impact uh, airflow uh, around the wing. And then here on the right is really the, the striking picture um, of a, a commercial jet with its nose cone uh, bashed in and some pretty serious damage to the uh, windshield of the aircraft. So not only are the uh, is the uh, radar in the nose cone damaged, but also uh, the pilot's ability to see is, uh, is compromised in this case. So along with hail, uh, uh, you know, lightning, of course, is, is kind of a common hazard um, associated with, with thunderstorms. Uh, it's a discharge of static electricity uh, within the atmosphere. And that static electricity comes from ice in, the, uh, in the, the thunderstorm, so ice towards the top of the storm. Now, one thing to keep in mind, uh, pretty much for, for everyone, whether you're a, a pilot or um, doing some other kind of, of outdoor mission, is that lightning likes to take the fastest route to the ground. So, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, of course, uh, important to avoid being the tallest object outside, uh, and it's also important to avoid being near the tallest object outside when, during a lightning storm. So in terms of aircraft, uh, you know, lightning is incredibly dangerous for people, um, but aircraft are much more protected by uh, storms. So lightning strikes can melt uh, portions of the exterior of an aircraft. Um, and might damage some of the sensitive uh, sensitive electronics on board. Um, so, you know, it's important to, to get your aircraft inspected uh, after a strike and make sure there's no really lasting damage. Um, but in most cases, at least with regards to commercial aircraft, they're designed to withstand lightning strikes. Um, the, the lightning will travel through the exterior of the aircraft and then exit uh, through the, uh, the, the nose or the tail, depending on where it struck to begin with. So here's a uh, kind of cool video uh, I found of lightning striking a uh, jet uh, over London. So see a little light right there is the jet, and then it gets struck right there. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty, pretty, uh, Pretty wild video to, to watch that uh, watch that happen. So one way to identify uh, lightning hazards in thunderstorms is to look for 
uh, look at the edges of clouds. So it's really important to identify the potential for lightning. And this certainly isn't a kind of hard rule. You can get lightning um, in uh, other cases, but when it comes to kind of what we think of as a kind of classic thunderstorm, uh, lightning happens when there's ice in a storm. So what does that look like for, uh, you know, in a photograph or if you were flying near one of these? So here's a photo of a uh, mature thunderstorm. Uh, here's the anvil cloud. Um, if there is an anvil cloud present, it's uh, pretty much a sure bet that there's, uh, that there's going to be lightning associated with the storm. Um, one other way to see that is to look for kind of fuzzy clouds. And what I mean by that is if you look where these arrows are pointing, this cloud in here is kind of, uh, there's, there's not really any definition to it, right? It's kind of fuzzy. It's, it's kind of dull looking. And the reason for that is that that's a cloud that's composed primarily of ice. So if you see ice like this, if you see those kind of fuzzy clouds in a, uh, in a thunderstorm, it's a pretty good indicator that, uh, that, there, there could be lightning associated with it. And then uh, if you see these kind of sharper cloud edges, more what you think of when you, when you think of a uh, you know, cumulus cloud down here at the bottom, uh, those are uh, primarily liquid clouds. Um, and so those wouldn't be a lightning hazard. So kind of continuing on with, uh, you know, all the dangers of, uh, of thunderstorms are uh, downbursts, um, which is something that, that has a, a pretty tremendous impact on, on aviation. Uh, so downbursts, as you kind of see in this animation down here, are a strong downward moving region of air uh, that begins at the base of a thunderstorm, and then it impacts the ground and as it impacts the ground, like you can see in this animation, it spreads out uh, in all directions. And so uh, these things form when rain and hail is falling out of a storm. And that rain and hail that's falling pulls air down with it. And so it's pulling all of this air down with it, kind of out of the center of the storm and the result is you have a lot of wind that's coming out of your out of your thunderstorm. So, in terms of aviation, uh, downbursts have actually long been a uh, source of aircraft accidents. Um, so, the idea here, and the reason why they're so dangerous, is mostly if a downburst is occurring near an airport where there's an aircraft that's coming into land. So. Uh, that's, that's what's being shown here in this graphic. So you have this uh, jet that's on approach. The runway is down here in the bottom right. And as this jet is flying uh, to land, it first encounters kind of this, this bump of air. So it's encountering a headwind. You have this, this downdraft that's hit the ground. It's spread out in all directions. So this aircraft is flying, it encounters a headwind and also some upward motion. You can see that in these arrows here. You get sort of this curve here on the, the sides of your, your downdraft. And that causes the plane to lift up. Uh, and so as a result, a pilot might uh, decrease the pitch, uh, decrease altitude to compensate. And as that aircraft continues to fly, uh, and continues to come into land, it then encounters the main bulk of this downburst or this downdraft. And that's where the airplane is then kind of violently pushed towards the ground. Uh, and then after the craft emerges from the downburst, uh, it has a tailwind, so there's less lift. Uh, also, it's been pushed closer to the ground and so this airplane is then at much greater risk of uh, crashing into the ground due to a, a downburst. Uh, 
Uh, and actually, downbursts near airports uh, for for a long time were uh, kind of the catalyst for a lot of uh, weather research. Uh, really fueled a lot of uh, a lot of research in the United States. So uh, we'll wrap up thunderstorms here uh, with uh, this graphic uh, from the East Coast uh, showing a line of storms and each of these uh, black dots and the, the line with them, uh, those are uh, a uh, airplane flying in this airspace. And, you know, really just kind of highlights that uh, thunderstorm avoidance is really the best bet. Um, there's, there's a lot of hazards associated with these storms that can uh, make for uh, an incredibly dangerous and very unpleasant uh, flying experience. So I will uh, there turn it uh, back over to uh, Major Kess Mersick. This time it works. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the, the first thing before I, I jump into the thunderstorm anecdote, I forgot to give a chance to our participants to share anecdotes about heat, smoke, and wildfires. So if there's any of you who had some anecdotes that you wanted to share, you can please do so now. And I apologize for forgetting to do that prior, to, um, you know, before we did the thunderstorm. So if you want to participate, you can unmute yourself and share, or you can write your name in the chat and I'll call on you, whichever you prefer. Captain Wrighton, go ahead, sir. And I can stop my sharing so we can see your face. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, so last summer when we had the wildfires, uh, I was flying back from Pullman with my wife and uh, we could see the uh, smoke over by Yakima and a little bit of the stuff up by Wenatchee. And for us instrument pilots, uh, we like to fly along Victor 2, which is, a, or Victor 4, excuse me, the corridor between Ellensburg back into Seattle. And as I was flying along that route, uh, the smoke and all the heat and everything changed the barometer by uh, three tenths. And so as I was flying along, my altitude was so far off, I was off by 350 feet that air traffic control uh, advised me um, to check my altimeter and advised me what the uh, temporary settings were flying through the area near Ellensburg for a span of about 20 miles and then resumed back to my uh, normal settings and fly home from there. So that's the kind of effect that uh, thunder or not, no, uh, wildfires and stuff can have. And you're, and you're not even flying near them. You're just uh, 20 to 30 miles away from where all the hot stuff is. Thank you. Now it's actually good to hear that as we have a bunch of cadets who are wishing to become pilot dev to be aware of all this type of information. Is there anybody else? Oh, I see Lieutenant Colonel Wallace, C-130 operation in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Why don't you jump in, sir? Okay, let's see. Can you see, can I, can you hear me and see me? Yes, we do, sir. Go all right, ahead. very good. Uh, yeah, one thing about being in both Kuwait or Saudi Arabia is you do get extremely hot uh, uh, tarmac uh, conditions. So hot, in fact, that when you're going into pre-flight the aircraft, ground crew did a great job of trying to get uh, ducted air conditioning into the aircraft to get the temperatures down so you can do a, do a pre-flight. But even at that, uh, the sun-soaked aircraft can get so hot, you have to wear gloved hands to be able to touch any uh, any of the panels uh, uh, to go ahead and do your do your pre-flight. It uh, it's ex extremely uh, uh, you know dangerous for the amount of heat that uh, can get collected in, on aircraft in uh, uh, you know on a tarmac that's um, maybe over 125 degrees uh, at tarmac temperature. So uh, it, I can I can relate to the to the tanker ops as well as that the aircraft performance goes down. Uh, it, it can be, ex be extremely uh, hard on the flight crews because of the temperature. And that's all I have. 
Thank you. Did you lose the sole of your boots, sir? Because I'm the sorry? temperature gets so hot that the soles of shoes will melt. <laughs> Somebody else want to jump in? Thank you for sharing, sir. Yeah, sure. It's Ernie Schnabler. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was five years uh, in charge of uh, counter drug operations in Washington Wing. We'd be flying uh, in support of, uh, of uh, the Drug Enforcement uh, Agency, DEA. And uh, we'd be flying hundreds of hours every year in marijuana eradication, uh, especially on the eastern slopes of the, uh, of the uh, Cascades and in, uh, in central Washington, eastern Washington uh, during the summer. And uh, all operations were below 1,500 feet, between 1,000 and 1,500 feet HEL, uh, where the temperature would not even budge from what was on the surface. So crew, uh, crew safety was always my most concern. We would carry a lot of, a lot of water. And of course, flying in a Nomex flight suit with gloves on and boots on, it was just unbearable because we didn't have any air conditioning. We don't have any air conditioning or any of our aircraft. Um, and we would be supporting uh, uh, helicopter operations of the DEA out of tiny little airports like Chelan or, or uh, uh, Brewster with really short runways. So you would fly into Brewster, a short runway in the morning when, uh, when the, the density altitude was really nice. And then as it heats up in the afternoon, you would have to shed some of your luggage, that personal luggage you had along, and leave it on the ground in order to take off uh, safely under the uh, increased uh, density altitude. It was really tough uh, to, uh, to maintain a, a level of sanity, a level of safety, uh, but safety always was our utmost concern uh, in, in, uh, in mission accomplishment. That's all I have, uh, and, and uh, that's the reason uh, why heat is really from a safety point of view and a hazard point of view. The most important one uh, was for me during that time of counter drug operations. Thank you very much for sharing, sir. I appreciate you taking the time. Anybody else want to jump in or should we skip to the next um, set of anecdotes? Okay, so it looks like we're going for the next set of anecdotes. And I'm going to share again. And we're skipping from that to, oops, of course, there's always a problem. Thunderstorm anecdotes. So for the thunderstorm, I have another story from Major Brian Sikema. Um, and I apologize if I mispronounce his name. Um, he was talking about the, uh, the fact that there are some areas that thunderstorms are more or less likely to form and a little bit like uh, senior member Connery was talking about. And depending on the area, they will appear and disappear really fast while others will stay longer. He was also mentioning um, that when he was in Oklahoma and Florida, it was actually pretty easy to, keep, to spot them and keep track of them, especially as they were following, you know, the line was moving across the mountain. And he uh, mentioned that when he was flying larger aircraft, he could go up in altitude and fly over the storm, but for the smaller ones, he could not do that. And this became an issue when he went into um, deployment in Afghanistan. So when he was in, in Afghanistan, he actually um, encountered some problem because there were thunderstorms that were forming in, in the mountains. That was a very treacherous area where he was working there. And what make it even more dangerous is the fact that there's this protrusion of Pakistan into Afghanistan, just like north of coast and south of Jalalabad. And uh, the Air Force actually has regulation for the pilot they have information they are not allowed to go close to the border they have a certain distance they have to stay away from the border with Pakistan and uh, one problem that he had is when the storms were arriving it happened where he was trapped in between the storm and the border and they were not allowed to go close to the border because they didn't want any international incident because they went over or got too close to it they 
didn't want that. At the time, it was uh, flying the MC-12, which is uh, an ISR-type aircraft, so intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And he was actually um, doing more like circling over specific areas so that he was monitoring and sending information to the ground teams that he was working with. And the advantage that he has is that on the MC-12, they actually have a, a weather radar that allowed him to monitor the weather in the area. And by using this radar, what they had to do is pretty much anytime they see a storm coming, they have to fly around it because that was a small aircraft. You could not fly over. They had to fly around it. They have to take into account where the Pakistanis border was. And sometimes they had to leave the area where they were totally and disconnect from the ground team. So they'll give heads up to the ground team, say, hey, we have to go. We have a storm. The ground team did not always understand why they were doing that, but they had to do that because they have to get out of the way, not to be pushed in onto Pakistan territory and then they circle around then come back to work with, um, again with their area so it was actually a, a pretty dangerous air, um, environment for him to work with um, he also you know similarly to what senior member Conrick mentioned he saw in his first deployment in Kandahar um, major hailstorm where they had 11 out of 15 aircraft that were majorly damaged to the point that had to be replaced. It's like there were major millions of dollars of damages. And um, in another, as for lightning, he mentioned one of the uh, um, one of his colleague pilots was flying an airplane that got hit by lightning that actually burned a hole in the fuselage and damaged electronic compound components. So even though the aircraft have some infrastructure to protect them for light, from the lightnings, it's not 100%. So you still have to be careful. You still have to track, monitor the, the thunderstorms and as much as possible, avoid them, go around them. Here, some similar pictures also showing hail damage on the windshield view from the inside um, on the, the upper right here and damage on the outside. And now I'm gonna call on to our participants for some thunderstorm anecdotes, please. Thank you. Uh, I if you don't mind, I can share my screen real quick on the flight path that I was doing. Please go ahead. Okay. Let's see here. So my experiences with thunderstorms, I had two uh, close encounters with lightning. And let me share this. In the spring of 2005, I did my commercial cross country and I flew from Renton down to Roseburg, then back to Portland. My home leg from Portland back to Renton. Uh, back in those days, you had to fly the whole thing VFR. And so my plan is to take off from Portland, go straight up to Battleground here, veer over towards Kelso. Everybody see these okay? We're all good? We see 12. Thank you for checking. Okay. And then... What happened was, was that it was a day much like it was today outside. It was nice and clear all the way down. And after about three hours, it was still clear coming here up into Portland. As I got over Vancouver and started to look towards Kelso here, right over this uh, set of hills and everything here, I saw this wall of clouds all building up and I knew I wasn't gonna be able to get through their VFR. So immediately I call up, uh, back in those days, we had Flight Watch. We had an airborne uh, weather service that we could check with. And so I gave him my location, told him I was over Battleground, headed north. And the flight briefer actually told me, they said there was a convective sigma just published 15 minutes ago for embedded thunderstorms and other lines of thunderstorms building throughout that whole sector where I was flying. As soon as he was done saying that over the radio, I looked right off my nose and I saw a couple of bolts touch down right straight over here. And I was flying at 6,500 feet. So those bolts were roughly uh, 8,500, 9,000 feet up all the way down to the ground uh, touching. So from there, I had to do my immediate uh, private pilot skills kick into the, and I did a circle about this tower right over uh, oh, Kalama right in here. 
and then lined up and landed right away at Kelso. And I spent the night in Kelso and flew home the next day. My second experience with lightning uh, occurred uh, while taking a friend on a cross country trip between uh, Renton and uh, Spokane. And we were going across the um, Snoqualmie Pass area here. Uh, usually you fly along Victor two in here. But uh, I was fortunate enough the gentleman's name was Alan Salzman, and he used to be a, a Civil Air Patrol pilot out of Colorado flying DEA mission. So he's riding along with me in my Cutlass in 2005. And as we're going here, we got just past uh, Bandera up into the mountains, and we could hear a crackling sound over the radio. And I had never figured out what that was. And he said there was a lightning touchdown somewhere nearby, and we picked it up on our frequencies. So he advised us, uh, we just turned around. Uh, scrapped that flight and came back home as soon as we possibly could and got back here to land. And uh, the third and final one that I've had where I've encountered lightning was a nighttime VFR flight coming home from Friday Harbor back into Renton out here over the San Juans. And I saw two nice big uh, puffy clouds here uh, to the bay uh, side of Whidbey Island and they actually had lightning arc between the two clouds. And one of my passengers pointed that out and commented, so wasn't that interesting? I says, looks interesting, looks nice, but we're not gonna go fly in and take a closer look at that. So those are my stories. Thank you very much, I appreciate. Um, from there, we are going to go back to Senior Member Conrad, thank you. Great. All right. So to continue a little bit on the, the theme of thunderstorms, I um, thought it'd be important to mention severe thunderstorms since we did talk about uh, hail and, and downdrafts. So here's a map on the right of uh, days with severe weather. Um, and you know, just like with that lightning map, eastern half of the United States lights right up. Uh, but we certainly also get um, our share of uh, severe thunderstorms, though not nearly as frequent. So when we talk about severe weather, severe thunderstorms, we're talking about um, thunderstorms that have wind greater than uh, 58 miles per hour or 50 knots, hail that's uh, one inch or greater. And then if there's a tornado in the storm, then the storm uh, instantly becomes severe. Uh, it's considered severe whether or not it has uh, wind or, or hail uh, associated with it. So speaking of tornadoes, um, across the United States, uh, this is a map of the average annual number of tornadoes. And uh, really it's, I included it here just to highlight that uh, even though the weather around here uh, may be a little more benign than uh, the rest of the country, uh, we do see here in the Northwest our uh, share of, of tornadoes as well. Though of course, nothing quite like the Eastern half of the country. So tornadoes are by definition, a violently rotating column of air that's in contact with the ground. Now that's important because if that rotating column of air is not in contact with the ground, then it's actually just considered to be a, a funnel cloud and not a, not a tornado. So here on the right is an image from Greensburg, Kansas in 2007. This was after an EF5 tornado tore through the town and uh, you know, you, you can get a sense that there wasn't much left after that, uh, after that storm went through. So the damage ratings uh, range from EF0 to EF5. Um, and an EF0 is very minor damage, maybe some shingles lost, uh, bigger branches broken, things like that. And then an EF5 is exactly what you're seeing here on the right. So it's uh, absolutely devastating damage. Homes are completely removed from their foundations and cars have been thrown for uh, thousands of feet as well. So um, because uh, Civil Air Patrol does uh, do uh, missions related to disaster relief, I thought it was important to include uh, this slide, um, the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning. So if you're on the ground and you're doing a mission and you hear that there's a tornado watch, uh, there's not really any need to, need to panic. It really just means that a tornado is possible, that the conditions are favorable for 
thunderstorms to develop that have a tornado in them. So uh, it's it's just saying, hey, let's let's keep an eye out. Uh, storms may produce tornadoes. Whereas a tornado warning means that a tornado has been either spotted by a trained weather spotter on the ground, or that radar has indicated the presence of very strong rotation that would indicate uh, that there's a tornado on the ground. So uh, anyway, just, just thought it was important to include that. Um, and if you do happen to be uh, in the path of a tornado, uh, it's always best to be in the lowest level of a building, uh, away from windows, away from doors, um, preferably, like this diagram shows, in a basement and in an interior room. Uh, if, there, if you don't have a basement and there's a tornado uh, that's, that's threatening, um, getting into an interior room without windows um, and uh, getting as low to the ground as possible is uh, another um, alternative. So from a disaster relief standpoint, uh, after the storm uh, can be pretty tricky to navigate. Uh, so after a tornado has gone through, there's the risk for, uh, you know, encountering downed power lines, broken water and gas lines, uh, as well as uh, hazardous debris uh, that the tornado uh, kicked up. Uh, that's perhaps unevenly distributed. So there's the, the risk for uh, tripping and, and fall hazards. Now, if you're, if you're working a disaster relief mission, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, a lot of areas that experience tornadoes, uh, folks have storm shelters. And like this image here on the right shows, sometimes those storm shelters can actually be blocked by debris. So it's important to uh, do a, a thorough search for uh, the potential for hidden storm shelters, as well as other blocked uh, hiding spots. So aviation, of course, is not uh, immune from tornadoes. Uh, here on the left is uh, damage to not only the airport, see the broken glass, but also damage to uh, commercial jet uh, in St. Louis in 2015. And then here on the right is from uh, last year in uh, Monroe, Louisiana, uh, damage to uh, a regional airport uh, down there. So moving on to uh, another type of uh, kind of warm climate hazard uh, is uh, hurricanes, which of course we don't experience around here, but uh, uh, you know, we do often work uh, relief missions, so uh, important to mention them. So hurricanes are large, low pressure systems uh, in tropical environments. Uh, they mostly impact uh, in the United States, the southeastern US and the Gulf Coast. And when one of these hurricanes uh, impacts the southeast, it brings with it uh, flooding rain, very heavy precipitation, uh, storm surge, strong wind, and even uh, tornadoes can be embedded within some of the stronger, um, stronger bands of precipitation. So here on the right is a radar image from Hurricane Harvey that uh, impacted uh, Texas in 2017 and really gives a nice uh, look at the structure of one of these storms. So there's usually an eye to a hurricane. It may be well-defined, it may not be, but surrounding the eye are these strong bands of uh, thunderstorms, these strong bands of precipitation. Uh, and it's within these bands that you're likely to encounter uh, gusty winds, really heavy rain, and the potential for a tornado. Now, in one of these storms, if you're looking at a storm like this image here on the right from a, a top-down perspective, uh, being in this upper right quadrant is uh, really the most dangerous place uh, to, to be. Um, so right around the eye of the storm, of course, is where the strongest winds are. It's called the eye wall. But in this top right or this upper right quadrant, uh, we see the greatest amount of storm surge the uh, strongest winds. 
associated with uh, this hurricane and also the greatest potential for uh, tornadoes. So uh, a few pictures here, uh, and I believe uh, Major Kasmarisek has a few more from uh, Tyndall Air Force Base, but uh, uh, here on the left is some storm surge damage from the, the vicinity of the airbase. And then here on the right is uh, wind damage. So this was a aircraft hangar, and you can now see some of the uh, aircraft uh, inside of it. So Hurricane Harvey in 2017 produced a ton of flooding over Houston, uh, and it really highlighted that these storms, these hurricanes, are very large. And so as a result, you get uh, prolonged periods, really long periods, several hours to potentially days of uh, losses. So of strong winds, of storm surge, um, and of damage. So once again, I'll uh, turn it over to Major Kasmersik for uh, some anecdotes. And I'm back. And so the first anecdote I have is from our chaplain, Union Colonel Dave Franklin, who is the deputy chaplain of the Washington Wing. And in the 1983, he experienced Hurricane Alicia in Texas. As you can see from the, the picture, he has, you can see the storm again, you know, you can see the spinning the same way, you see the eye. So it's very typical of storm, the structure, the anatomy that senior member Conrad was describing earlier. And uh, you can see how it, it impacted this area over there. So that's where it reached the land. And uh, Chaplain Franklin was saying that in 1983, he actually lived right uh, where the eye of Hurricane Alicia was going. The winds were very strong winds. They were 100 miles per hour. They had 12 feet flood surge. Um, that time he wasn't working with CP, but he was pastoring in a church. And he was saying there were power out at outage um, for several days, devastation throughout the whole area. In he was already flying, he was a pilot, and when he flew over the area, he was really shocked by what he saw. He said that it was a terrible sight to see so many hangars and airplanes destroyed. He was down by Houston, NASA at Ellington um, Air Force Base. Um, at the time, uh, Chaplain Franklin lived on a story, a second story apartment. He had just moved up from the first one. And he had a short time before discussed with his wife how if there's a major flood, Houston is only 20 feet up. It's like we can get majorly flooded and that would be very dangerous. So that was kind of um, a good thing that they had moved up one level in, um, in their habitation. And but one of the most interesting thing he said I talked about were the fire ants. And mm -hmm. as he said, they literally bite like fire. They will come out of the ground where they live and ball up on the floating branch like a red rubber kickball and flood with the current. And he said, and I really believe it, you really wouldn't want that to land on you as you were waiting waist deep through the water getting out of the buildings. And just to make it a little more, a bit more obvious, here in the middle, you have one of these fire ants that are coming from South um, America. And on the left, you can see how they climb onto each other and they form these boats and, and they're able, these rafts that they're floating all over the water. Imagine if you waist deep in that, it's just like really scary. Um, their sting is very strong. You can have infection and then scaring. And some people actually have some allergic reaction and they can be fatal because of that. Um, the specialists say use detergent as a, the best defense but against this flooding um, boat raft. But this is actually one of the things that is scaring a lot of the people. 
uh, when they're coming out of the building. Um, uh, this is a view from the airport, the, the control tower. Apparently, there was a very quiet day because there was no, almost no airplane. You can see the major wind pushing the, the branches of the palm trees, the water surge, and some aircraft that have been um, flipped over by the winds. In the second one, as announced by Senior Member Conrad, I'm going to quickly talk about Tyndall Air Force Base. They had Hurricane Michael, who hit um, the area in October 2018, and that was a Category 5 hurricane. This hurricane pretty much leveled uh, the base. A few buildings, you know, were constructed a different way and they weren't too bad. They had maybe some roof damage, that was it. While some other were totally leveled, totally destroyed. You can see here the control tower and all the, the buildings around. The winds were reaching 155 miles per, per hour. That's pretty strong, pretty nasty. Tore roofing, destroy or mangled buildings. So here we have a before and after picture of the base. And you can see, for example, you see that white building there? Well, you don't find it there. Uh, a lot of the other building, you'll notice uh, roof damage, trees down. And here you can see there are four aircraft on, this, on display here in a diamond shape. Look at this one here. Well, it got flipped over and thrown to the side. So this is a pretty heavy aircraft. It's really difficult to go and move them. Here's a close up of uh, the F-15 that got flipped. It was a display one that was a static display, but it was anchored to the ground and it got flipped over. Um, the other thing, if you look from the damages, you can see roofing, um, damage, you can see structure damage. This is actually the same pictures that I remember um, Conrick was using. And actually, Cadet Captain Kasmarsik, my son, in summer 2019, did the NCSA down at Tyndall Air Force Base. It's the Air Force Civil Engineering Academy where they talk about how to set up and maintain and, and you know, all the things around the, the bases, so the civil engineering side of the Air Force. And um, so they tour the area. As you can see, this is one of the Civil Air Patrol Cessna. I don't think this one will fly. I'm not going to try. Um, but here you have um, the cadets. You see Cadet Kasmarsik here in the front. Um, they actually, as part of their training, they participated in the cleanup of the base and they included like sorting through things, trashing what is not recoverable because it's too damaged and things like that. They had to sleep in tents because there were so many damages that, you know, they didn't have enough building. There's also some bases, that's why they they did. But so anyway, um, so that was a great experience for them to be not only studying the civil engineering side of the Air Force, but also participate observe and participate in the cleaning of a base that was that much. If you have any question regarding that NCSA, you are welcome to contact him. I have put his email up there, but uh, if you um, don't remember his email, you can send me an email and I'll send it to him. Anybody has a quick uh, uh, hurricane anecdote or tornado anecdote to go? Yeah, Otherwise, we will um, move on. Yes, go ahead. Um, um, I, grew, I grew up in the uh, panhandle of Florida. My mom was from New Orleans. And um, so the whole northern Gulf Coast is, is very familiar with these storms. I was home um, after Michael. And even as late as December, the only thing that was up and running as far as medical care in, in Panama City was one ER. And so Pensacola was, and other cities around uh, Tyndall were still taking patients who had to have care beyond basic emergency care. And um, also, if you go to Tyndall's website, they are going to rebuild Tyndall as the Air Force Base of the future. And there's a lot of new science that they're going to be uh, using. And I thought that tied in with an awful lot of our program. So I just uh, wanted to bring that up. That's all. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, because of time, I was kind of um, shorting, but yes, they're doing a lot of work. And for those interested in civil engineering, th this is a, a great opportunity to learn. Um, Senior Member Conrick, they're yours. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Major. So let's talk a bit about uh, flooding, and then we'll get into uh, aircraft icing, turbulence, and then uh, we'll, be, we'll be finished for the day. So, um, you know, flooding is associated not only with heavy precipitation, uh, but also here in Washington is associated uh, pretty commonly with uh, snow melt. So uh, floods can cause major property damage, of course, can also cause environmental problems like landslides, which I'll mention uh, here in a minute. Um, so in Washington, uh, we generally have different uh, causes of floods in the eastern and western parts of the state. So in eastern Washington, uh, it's predominantly snowmelt and uh, thunderstorms or heavy, heavy showers that cause flooding. Um, in western Washington, it's uh, snowmelt uh, at higher elevations and also uh, at lower elevations, a lot of the flooding is from uh, atmospheric rivers, which are uh, very strong uh, and uh, uh, heavily precipitating uh, low pressure systems. So near airports, uh, flooding can be really quite, uh, quite catastrophic and uh, pretty damaging. So here's a, a picture on the right from uh, Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, you can see the floodwaters uh, encroaching on the runway. Uh, filling a, a, a few buildings. Uh, and for context, uh, that Air Force Base is uh, right here in the circle. Uh, Omaha is, is up here just out of this map. And uh, the base is located basically right at uh, the point where the uh, Missouri River meets the Platte River in Nebraska. And so where you have this really low-lying area, uh, next to these two rivers is extremely susceptible to floods. So uh, I believe uh, last month there was the, the non-meteorological hazard uh, uh, lesson. And uh, I know one thing that, that was talked about, or I believe one thing that was talked about was uh, slope failures and landslides. And so following heavy rain or following a lot of snow melt, um, soil becomes very saturated, it becomes unstable, and this can lead to collapse. And so here on the left is from uh, a landslide in Grays Harbor County. And then here on the right is kind of an interesting example from West Virginia. So this is at uh, Yeager Airport in Charleston, West Virginia. And this is a landslide at the end of uh, the runway there. So this is a uh, man-made hill and uh, following a lot of uh, snow melt and then also heavy spring rains, uh, this slope was destabilized and damaged uh, part of the airport property right there. So let's shift, uh, shift gears a little bit now and uh, get into some talk about uh, aircraft icing. Um, so icing is obviously uh, very problematic and can be cat catastrophic for, for aircraft, uh, especially if no, no measures are taken, no anti-ice uh, measures are, are taken during flight. So here on the right side, is a diagram showing the, the effects of icing on an aircraft. And so as you build up ice onto the airframe, you reduce the thrust, uh, the weight of the aircraft is, is increasing due to all that ice accumulating. Uh, the drag is increasing because again, all of that ice uh, kind of affects the smooth surface of the airplane. And so, you have decreased lift, I mentioned decreased thrust, and all of this is a recipe for, uh, for an aviation disaster. And so it's really important to quickly identify icing 
uh, and uh, take appropriate measures to uh, to counteract it. So icing on aircraft isn't actually caused by flying through ice clouds like we talked about with with thunderstorms. Uh, instead, it's caused by what's called supercooled liquid water. And that supercooled liquid water generally freezes on contact with the aircraft. So this very short clip here that I'm going to show um, is uh, from a science experiment where this person has a bottle of pure water that they put in a freezer, got it below freezing, and it didn't freeze because it's, it's incredibly pure. And they're going to pour it on a dish that they also had in the freezer. Uh, they're being very careful because if they, they hit the uh, bottle too hard, it will uh, freeze up. And so you'll notice when they pour it, it freezes right away. And so this is actually a kind of a fun experiment you can uh, do at home uh, if you're into uh, that kind of thing. So this exact process happens uh, in the atmosphere. And in fact, most icing reports on aircraft uh, occur between minus 20 degrees Celsius and zero degrees Celsius. That's what's being shown here on the right hand side. Uh, here we have the percentage of icing reports and then there's temperature and the shaded region is that uh, is, is where we see the most reports overall. But generally we tend to see, oops, Apologies for that. Generally, we tend to see uh, pretty much all of our icing between minus 20 and zero. So this uh, kind of is a good point to uh, uh, mention that an aircraft does have to be in a cloud uh, to start uh, accumulating uh, icing. There's two kinds of, of icing that, uh, that we'll mention, the first being rime ice. Uh, so this happens when you're flying through um, clouds that are composed of supercooled liquid water. And rime ice forms from very small cloud droplets that freeze very quickly on contact with the aircraft. And they freeze so quickly that they actually trap a lot of air inside of, uh, the, the, inside of the ice. And so as a result, uh, you get sort of this white or opaque appearance, and this ice breaks very easily. And so that's actually a really good thing for aircraft because uh, anti-ice measurement, anti-ice measures will uh, break off this rime ice relatively easily. Clear ice is the other kind of uh, icing that really, really impacts aviation. Forms from larger drops. So you can think of kind of raindrop size uh, drops that are hitting your uh, wings. And those drops hit your wing and they're larger. So they take a little bit longer to freeze. And so as a result of that slower freezing, uh, there's no air trapped inside. And so this kind of ice is much more dangerous because it's a lot harder. Uh, and it's also a lot harder to see. So within different kinds of clouds, uh, icing is, is uh, a little bit different. So in stratiform clouds, so kind of these gray skies that uh, Western Washington is, is so well known for, um, icing tends to be uh, a problem for a much longer period of time. And what I mean by that is these stratiform clouds cover very large areas, so you get prolonged exposure if you're flying through it. Uh, the greatest potential for icing is generally just below freezing, between 0 and minus 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, the most intense icing would be kind of towards the, the top of the cloud. Uh, and usually, when it comes to icing in stratiform clouds, it tends to be a shallow layer. What I mean by that is if you change your altitude a little bit, you can get out of the icing conditions. Now, this all contrasts with uh, cumulus clouds, uh, kind of like we talked about with thunderstorms, where they have a much larger vertical area. So they're very deep, but very narrow. And so as a result, the center or the updraft of the cloud and up at the top of the cloud have the greatest icing dangers, but there tends not to be much danger 
uh, kind of on the, or at least less danger, kind of along the edges of a cloud. Um, severe icing is uh, possible and likely in uh, mature thunderstorms. Uh, but again, let's let's just not fly through. Let's just not fly through thunderstorms. Uh, let, let's take that away from uh, from from the lessons today. So as far as uh, mitigation and uh, avoidance for aircraft, uh, it's always a good idea to check the pilot reports before you fly to see if there's any reports of icing. Uh, again, uh, avoid thunderstorms or strong cumulus clouds. And a few thousand feet, maybe even less of altitude change can make all the difference when it comes to icing. So getting to a little bit warmer air or at least getting out of the region where ice is accumulating can be very important. So once again, I'll pass the baton to uh, Major Kasmersik uh, for some talk about uh, icing. Hello, thank you. Um, so we, I'm gonna have um, a couple of presentation on the, on anecdotes for cold weather. And these take place in Fairchild Air Force Base. These are anecdotes from uh, Major Sikema again. Uh, we spent almost two hours talking. He had so many great information. Sadi was unable to come today. But anyway, he was talking that um, at the Air Force Base, uh, they have uh, quite a few aircraft, and especially uh, a selection of KC-135. And uh, what they do, to be uh, before flying, of course, you check all the reports, you check the TFR. Always, that's one of the big advice he gave. Check your TFR, check your TFR, and keep checking your TFR. Even while you're flying, check if the things are evolving. Um, so one of the thing that the tanker relies on is on the weather prediction from um, the 92nd Operation Support Squadron for the weather shop because they need to have like up to the minute flying condition before takeoff. But it's not the only thing that they need. It's not just the flying condition. It's also the ground condition. So there's a huge maintenance crew that goes around and that has to manually clean the aircraft of, of snow and ice that is on top of it. They have to clear the tarmac, um, you know, to, to remove all the snow to make it usable for the um, the aircraft and, and the pilots. They have a special wheel equipment that they use that um, is uh, a way for them to check the runway condition reading and they have to communicate this information to the pilots. So this is important for takeoff and for landing so that they know how to maneuver work on the um, on the tarmac, adjust their flying to or their cruising to the conditions of the, the tarmac. And it was saying, especially when you're turning and apparently recently they had an aircraft that skid and ended up having the nose wheel going on, onto the dirt. So that was a minor thing because uh, there was no damage, but that was still something that can be quite scary. It is um, quite impressive to see that, you know, you have the people climbing on the aircraft and that's scooping the all the ice off of the, the aircraft. Once they've manually finish that side, they will use de-icing. So they use chemicals that they project onto the aircraft to finish um, removing all the ice from it. And then after that, they apply an anti-ice fluid. And the anti-ice fluid acts kind of like a gel that will um, stick to the to, to the fuselage and the wings, to, it will stick to the, the body of the aircraft so that the snow will not attach to it and will not form gel on top of it. There's uh, pros and cons with this. Um, it costs a lot of money. And uh, the other con is the anti-icing is weight. And any extra weight means that you have a lower takeoff performance and because you're adding more, more weight and more drag. Um, so that's something to take into account. The other thing they have to worry about when they're on the ground is the APU, the auxiliary power unit. 
because even though the EPU works fine in cold weather, you have to worry about the, um, the doors. So you see on here that there's uh, some doors like the exhaust door, oops. You have the exhaust door here and um, the intake, um, we don't see it on the on the picture, but um, from what was written on the picture, it's written exhaust on both of them. Um, so anyway, and uh, they have to manually I, uh, open and close these doors because they can be frozen shut. If it's frozen shut, it can't work properly. They can be dangerous. So you have the boom operator that once again will go and double check and uh, manually um, operate this door to make sure that they can safely um, use the APU and use the aircraft. Once they're off and they're flying, they have the, the anti-ice for, for a little bit, but depending on the condition, ice is still going to be forming. And when you have a larger aircraft, a little bit more weight is something that the aircraft can handle. But on the smaller aircraft, this is a big issue that can cause lots of problems. So typically, uh, as senior member Conrad showed, there are different types of ice, um, but they typically build up on blunt edges and on the leading edge edges and to counteract that these edges have heating system to be able to um counter the um, the, the, the freezing effect and uh, the other thing is the pilots have to be careful how they use their engine because they don't want anything to freeze um by the the engine so they also say that they have to keep up keep the engine up and self idling to keep it warm so that ice will not form. And they have to use like gentler descents uh, or use speed brake to keep some of the power up so that they don't free, you know, they don't go and get too cold and freeze. It's, so they have to avoid the formation of ice and chunk of ice can be really dangerous, especially if it goes into the engine. So the spinner core is gonna be heated because if there's ice that builds up, then the when the, the pilot is gonna speed up, the astronauts are gonna go into the engine and cause damages. The electronic side, so the avionics inside the aircraft and partially, you know, close to the outside, it can handle a range of temperature. Um, but very cold air can still be a problem. But Major Sikema was saying that usually it's not a huge deal to warm up the aircraft, especially on the inside. It's usually too warm and so uh, and not too cold. So that's one of the issue with the summer. But in the winter, it, they like the warmth. He also recalls um, a flight to Alaska that he did when the temperature was reaching minus 50 Fahrenheit, so negative 50 Fahrenheit. And he was saying that at that point, you have to be very careful because these aircraft are sealed. Um, and so when you open the doors, you have a pressure di difference. So when you open, you have the, with the pressure difference, you have the outdoor air that is extremely cold will come in and that will cause cracking of the windows. And we have to remember that the windows are glued and sealed with epoxy that requires, you know, a certain range of temperature for curing. So when you're in the cold weather in Alaska and you have to fix a window, you have to fix, you know, using epoxy, it's a big issue because it needs certain range of temperature and it takes much longer time to do that. And that's what I have for the cold weather. Do we have any participants who have some sharing regarding cold weathers? That's fine. Uh, Major Sikema sent us a bunch of anecdotes to help us with that. So that was great. Thank you. So in that case, uh, Senior Member Conrick, they're yours. Excellent. All right. Thank you again, Major. Um, so my apologies if I end up going a little bit over time. Um, I'll try to get through this. Um, so the final uh, topic for today's lesson is uh, turbulence. So, you know, turbulence is something that, that most folks are pretty familiar with. And the kind of primary cause of turbulence is a change in wind speed 
or wind direction. And that can be uh, the result of the jet stream, fronts, uh, thermals. Uh, the glider pilots are very happy to have thermals. Um, and then thunderstorms and also mountains. And so all these things we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. So uh, first up is the jet stream. So this is probably a, a word that, mo a phrase that most of you are, are familiar with. Uh, so the jet stream is a fast moving uh, ribbon of air, uh, you can think of it as, that uh, encircles the planet uh, at both poles. So uh, you can think of the jet stream as a boundary between warm air to the south and uh, much colder air to the north. So that creates a large pressure gradient and that helps to accelerate uh, wind um, in the jet. So with regards to turbulence, uh, turbulence is often reported around the jet stream. And the reason for that is you get large changes in wind speed over very short distances. So here on the right hand side, kind of this back image is uh, an old forecast of the jet and these colors, if you can see those, are in knots. And so there's this jet stream that's impacting uh, Washington State and into uh, Idaho and, and southern uh, British Columbia. And you can imagine that if you're flying from San Francisco to Seattle, then you're starting out in an area with very weak winds at upper levels, and you're traveling to Seattle where the jet stream's right overhead. And so that big change in wind speed is going to cause uh, turbulence for your flight. There's also turbulence as you climb or descend through the jet. So this is uh, a three-dimensional uh, phenomena. And so that's what this kind of inset image shows where you can almost think of it as a tube with the strongest winds at the center. And as you climb through the jet or descend through the jet, uh, you have another rapid change in wind speed. And so that's going to cause uh, turbulence. So another way that the jet stream uh, produces uh, turbulence for aircraft is differences in wind speed uh, along the jet. So, you know, on this example here, you have a, a really fast area of wind over the upper Midwest and Great Lakes and much slower wind uh, over uh, Wyoming and Montana. And so it's those changes also that uh, can make for uh, a turbulent ride. Now along fronts, uh, we also have turbulence, and this is mostly due to a change in wind direction along a front. So here on the left is a cold front where uh, here's the, the frontal boundary and you have cold air behind, warm air ahead, and there's an abrupt change in wind direction as that front passes over you. And that change in wind direction uh, at the surface is going to uh, cause turbulence. Now, we oftentimes think of fronts as being kind of this two-dimensional uh, feature you see on a weather map, but in reality, they are three-dimensional things, right? They're three-dimensional features and they slope with height. So even though the warm front or cold front may have passed your location at the surface, that doesn't mean that it's not going to be turbulent aloft or it doesn't mean that you're not going to pass through the front uh, during a flight. And so uh, here on the right is a cold front. And so if you're directly under the front, uh, you know, the front might have, have just passed you and the wind might be calming down. But if you were to uh, take off and fly, then you might encounter uh, that same wind direction change. Uh, but above the surface. Another way that we get uh, turbulence when we fly is through uh, thermals. So the idea here is that the surface of the earth is uneven in terms of uh, the, um, the kinds of, of surfaces that we have. Uh, and so darker surfaces like plowed fields, parking lots, things like that, are going to warm a lot faster than lighter surfaces do or uh, than water does. And so as a result, you heat the ground unevenly. Some areas of the ground, some areas that were heated uh, then heat 
the air directly above and that causes air to rise and that's our thermal. So when it comes to identifying thermals, uh, cumulus clouds like here on the right are a really good indicator that there's going to be a lot of thermals. So where you see these cloudy areas, you have little pockets of rising warm air. And where you tend to see these more clear areas, that's where we would expect downward motion. So uh, all of the upward motion uh, of a thermal is balanced by downward motion somewhere else. And uh, in this case, the downward motion is the, the clear skies. Thunderstorms are uh, another good source of turbulence. Um, so we, we talked about updrafts and, and downdrafts. And that updraft downdraft pair can create a pretty unpleasant uh, bit of turbulence if you happen to be flying through. The typical updraft is on the order of 15 to 30 miles per hour. Uh, the typical downdraft, 7 to 15. Uh, but in really severe thunderstorms, the updraft can actually exceed 100 miles per hour. So just another reason why uh, we shouldn't be flying through thunderstorms. So the final uh, bit here uh, is talking about some mountain-induced turbulence. Um, so let's jump right into mountain waves, something that's very common over the Western US. So the idea here is like on this image here on the right, you have a mountain range and you have airflow that's passing over the mountain. And so as that airflow passes over, um, it uh, gets perturbed, it gets uh, lifted upwards by the mountain. And depending on the stability of the atmosphere, that might uh, excite these waves uh, in the atmosphere. And so this results in basically couplets of upwards and downwards motion. Um, also causes uh, lenticular clouds, which I have a couple of pictures of here in a second. Um, and these waves can extend pretty high into the atmosphere. So just because you don't see clouds doesn't mean that uh, you know, you're not going to be impacted by the mountain waves. So a little bit of identification. Uh, here's a satellite image uh, over Montana. And these linear streaks on the satellite image are uh, a mountain wave. So uh, this is one way to kind of uh, identify mountain waves. Uh, there are SIGMETs that are issued for mountain waves um, uh, that, that you should be checking before you fly as well. Visually, uh, lenticular clouds uh, are a, a good sign that there's a, that there's a mountain wave present. And so uh, this is an image from the, the top of the uh, office building that I work at at, at the university. And uh, you can see these lenticular clouds uh, kind of off in the distance there. Uh, another way that mountains cause uh, unpleasant flying experiences is through uh, what's called gap winds. Uh, these are pretty common uh, along our uh, mountain passes uh, in Washington. So the idea is that if you have air flowing through a gap in a mountain, that air on the upwind side gets compressed into that gap. And so you have this, this air that's getting compressed in, and so it speeds up, just like if you put your thumb over a, over a hose and the water shoots out faster. And then as it exits the gap, it slows down. And so this acceleration uh, is a cause of, of turbulence uh, and uh, should certainly be, uh, be, you should certainly be aware of it before flying through uh, gaps in terrain. Uh, one place where this is actually really common too is the uh, the Columbia River Gorge um, on the uh, Washington Oregon border. And finally, uh, some talk of of downslope winds. Um, these are common in uh, central and eastern Washington along the Cascades, and so they're actually fairly common when you have a storm system or a low pressure system over the Pacific Ocean just offshore. And that sets up a pressure gradient where you have low pressure offshore, high pressure inland, and that accelerates wind over the uh, 
uh, cascades. And so uh, this image here shows sort of those ingredients. You have colder and more dense air on one side of the mountain. And then uh, that basically sort of spills over the mountain and gets compressed as it descends the other side of the mountain and results in strong winds uh, that can actually be quite damaging coming down, uh, coming down the side of the mountain. So uh, that's uh, what I had for, uh, for turbulence and some mountain meteorology. I know it's a little fast, so, so I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions after, but uh, I'll uh, throw back to uh, Major Kasmersik uh, for a few anecdotes. Hi, I'm back. Oops. Apologize, I used the wrong computer. <laughs> That's always something. Um, thank you very much for a great presentation. I have a question for now. Um, are there any cadets who are going to go to the Flight Academy to do the Glider Academy in here? Any cadet who has done the flight academy in the glider section? I thought so. So didn't you think about anything when Tenure Member Conrick talked about these clouds forming and the upward? Isn't it something that you guys look for when you're trying to gain altitude with your gliders? That's one of the reasons it's important to learn about meteorology because you learn to recognize your cloud patterns and you learn to recognize the area where you want to go if you want to take altitude or, or not. And that's also why you guys are like spinning in circle because you're over this upward um, current. No, that, that was excellent on, on all that. I see in the chat that there was a couple of comments on the icing, how Eastern Washington is considered to be the, uh, I mean, what? The ice machine. Western Washington is the ice machine. I always thought the Eastern Washington is the ice machine. There's always so much ice over there. Actually, uh, Major Kasmarsik, uh, most of the North Cascades is one of the best places for natural icing in all of the United States because Boeing uses it for flight testing when they have to collect uh, ice and cowling and test the engines. Ah. <laughs> um, anybody have comments regard or, or other anecdotes regarding um, the last part where we talked about the turbulences? So I'll tell you about my scariest flight in my life. It was in the early 90s. I was on a 10-seater aircraft. I am not a pilot. I'm a geologist. Like I always say, the only thing that flies for me are rocks spitted by a volcano. But I was a passenger in an aircraft, a 10-seater. I was doing research on the field that was in the middle of the rainforest in Brazil in the Amazon Basin. And this aircraft, I am not sure about the maintenance, but it was kind of like squiggly. So I was like, oh my goodness, did I tighten all the bolts? And we were, head, we're going through an area of major turbulence. We were flying over the rainforest. There was no visible roads, no visible habitation. We were in the middle of white light. If we crashed, they will never found us. So that was the scariest fight of my life, encountering turbulence in this type of area. Um, if anybody have any questions for, for us, please go ahead. If not, I have a question for um, Senior Member Conrad before we, we, let, we say thank you and let people go. What does it take to become a meteorologist, sir? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, it takes, uh, among other things, just uh, kind of the desire and um, sort of passion for, for science and for uh, kind of understanding the, the world uh, around you. Um, a lot of meteorologists kind of have this, this uh, moment, this event that they experienced where, you know, kind of turned them on to being uh, a meteorologist. For, my, for me, it was uh, 
years of lake effect snow in the Midwest and also a uh, uh, tornado that, uh, that hit my house uh, growing up. Um, and uh, so beyond that though, um, you know, the education and training is, uh, is plenty of uh, math and, and physics, uh, but, you know, forecasting the weather doesn't always require, um, you know, it doesn't require you to sit down and, and really uh, do a lot of, a lot of equations and, and a lot of math on a daily basis. Um, a lot of forecasting is, is pattern recognition um, and uh, uh, just sort of experience with, with, uh, with weather maps and, and observations. Have you done any storm chasing? <laughs> uh, I have actually. Um, when I was in uh, when I was in college, uh, I did some storm chasing in uh, Illinois with a, a friend of mine, and uh, I also had uh, an internship uh, for for a summer in Oklahoma, and uh, did uh, did some storm chasing in uh, the, the Texas Panhandle when I was there, and uh, saw a uh, saw a funnel cloud that that did eventually uh, produce a tornado. That's awesome. It's kind of scary also when it you is. think about it. It is. Yeah, the, the, the storm itself isn't uh, quite as scary as, uh, to be honest, the, the lightning uh, around mm -hmm. it. Because uh, for the most part, you're the, you're the tallest thing out there. So it's, it's uh, very scary. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for um, taking care of this class, of teaching this class. I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you to all our participants. Thank you for those who uh, share anecdotes. And uh, I apologize for being a little bit over, but I want to thank you very, very much. I know it was a long class, but we cover a lot of material. This class is recorded and will be used in future training again. So you are immortalized on our drive. So <laughs> I want to thank you very, very much again. And if you have any questions for uh, City Member Conrick or myself, you can send us um, an email and uh, if you can't find us, you can find me on the WAMA A Aerospace webpage, or you can send it to WAMA and I will be receiving the email and I can forward the information. If you have any other questions, please, you're welcome to jump in. Otherwise, I'm handing over the mic to Lieutenant Colonel Goram. Thank you very much for waiting. <laughs>